welcome this conversation. This is a discussion that's held uh, within the FELA program. Uh, I'm joined by three guests who, who are distinguished in their own right. It's just coincidentally, each of them is an author, someone who has produced excellent books, and we can recommend these at a later stage. So we have Jane McStavish, we have Sheila Dara, and we have Tom Hartley. And, and the subject of our discussion is that period from 1980 to 1981. And the question I'm going to pose to each of my guests is, was that, was that a watershed moment in the history of Irish politics? And it's both just kind of recapping on, on the run-up to that period, and just for those who maybe are not familiar with it, and look at the chaos that was created around it, that this isn't something that just happened. This was a political program introduced in the mid-70s by a Labour government on the advice of uh, we suspect British intelligence to attack the weakest, as they saw it, link within the Republican uh, struggle to criminalise, normalise the, the struggle for Irish freedom. So, so Jake, and you were in the East Block at this stage. Was you. Can I ask you a question? I mean, the beatings, the madness, all the conditions that were inflicted upon the prisoners. Were the prisoners aware that this was a political strategy directed at them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you you posed the question at the start, is it a watershed moment? It clearly was, uh, and I think we're still working through uh, where that all that took us and takes us. If you want to look at the hate blocks, the hate blocks were populated by people in their early twenties at the oldest. You had a few, maybe twenty now, but there were a big section of ex-prisoners, and they were prisoners who had been in with political status, who had been released in 76, 77, when the struggle was on the web, who faced a policy by the British government of criminalisation, ulcerisation, normalisation, and fully understood that. So we all were back in prison within a relatively short time. So myself, Bobby Sands, Vic, Shannon Walsh, all those people who had spent a short period outside the prisons found themselves back in again. And to me, there was no difference in the struggle on the outside and on the inside. What we were faced with was the reality that someone, somewhere within the British establishment, had decided that the way to demoralise the struggle and the way to break the struggle was to go for the weakest link. That was the men on the hate blocks and the women on Armagh. And we were very clear, Bobby Sands articulated probably best. Bobby said, I'm not dying in the hate blocks for prison conditions. I'm dying because what's won and lost in these hate block cells is won and lost for those people that I'm proud to know as the risen people. That was it in a nutshell. That was the kernel of it. It wasn't about prison conditions. We obviously will talk later about how the prison campaign was fought, both inside and outside. But the five demands were a device, and we were very clear. Um, Francie Hughes articulated it some way. I fought them on the outside with an armalite. He says, I don't have an armalite, I'm going to fight them on the body. Let me ask Sheila. Sheila, you were in our at the time. Uh, as harsh a conditions that prevailed within the blocks, but a smaller group of people resisting that, 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 uh, that condition that was being inflicted. Did women have the same understanding? I mean, for me, I would think somehow there would be, there would be a kind of a, a bewilderment that, that one day you're being treated, I wouldn't say well, but you're being treated as a human being and the next day as a fully fledged attack will have on you. Were women aware that this was a strategy rather than simply a, a brainwave of someone? No, we were. We would have been very aware of it. We'd have been very aware of it. I mean, even in con conditions that were happening on the outside, because during that that period and the lead up to the hunger strikes and that, you had what was known as the Castlereagh conveyor belt. You had it was you know if you if you've ever read the book The Kitson Experiment, yeah. which was based in. I mean, he he started his stuff in Eden and and places like that, and it was just carried over in the six counties. You had, for instance, like in my in my area, which is a very wee, wee small area. Well, where is that? Bound cat. Okay. <laughs> Some people would know it as a yeah, short short. Short. But they they swooped one day and arrested seventeen women in one day. Seventeen young women in one day took mm -hmm. them all to Castle Ray. Um, 
And what was happening was they were arresting people when they turned 17. They were hitting areas like they hit Beachmount one week, that they hit our area the next week, that they hit Market the week after that. And it was all young people of around the same age. And a lot of those people, what we discovered in Armagh, there were IRA volunteers, there were people caught on operations, but there was a lot of women came into that jail who were innocent, who had signed statements for things like that. Because they were getting battered in Castle Rock. They were getting there was psychological torture, there was physical torture. They were signing statements and then they were appearing in front of a court and there was no jury, it was just, <clears> just <throat> a, a diplomat judge. And that was that one statement was accepted. So we knew very much that what was happening on the outside was an impact on the inside. So what was happening on the inside, we had to ensure they were also impacted on the outside. I want to come to Tom, uh, and we we are aware of the resistance in both of the prisons. Uh, can you put that in some kind of political context, Tom? Well, I mean, today we're I remember fifty years ago on internment. And I think if you want to understand what happened in the H blocks, you need to look at internment. By its nature, internment creates political prisoners because if you actually take someone off the street, lock them up without a trial, it's a very political act. Uh, and so I think the British uh, moved uh, in the early 70s to get rid of that problem. And it was Lord Gardiner who brought out a report that really points the way to what Jake was talking about, austerization, normalization, and uh, criminalization. And here I think I should mention that from the very uh, point of application of the strategy, it was doomed. Why? Because of Kieran Lugin, the very first Republican, very first, the very first second that they tried to put uh, that strategy in place, it failed. Uh, the at the same time, it took some time, I think, for the movement to fully understand the implications of that strategy. Uh, and then on the outside, there emerged the uh, Relatives Action Committee. And these were the relatives campaigning for the prisoners in uh, his block and in Armagh Women's Prison. Uh, and then there evolved uh, the uh, Relatives Action Committee uh, we're really existing in a state in, in a period where our strategy was if you support to support the prisoners, you had to support the struggle. But in itself, you start to clarify to support the IRA. Yes, the yes, and yes. The IRA. Okay. In that sense, it limited the uh, number of people who would be supporting the prisoners. So there was a process of a rethink, uh, and uh, what emerged was the formation of the National Hitch Block Committee on the five demands and instantly that uh, that started to allow people uh, to come in and support the prisoners. Uh, by that stage we had very good communications with the prisoners. So uh, we moved then to the hunger strike period and in essence uh, the hunger strikes really blew a hole in the strategy of the British to criminalise the Republican struggle because that's what the, the importance of that period was. And one of the ways that was achieved was, of course, the election of Bobby Sands. Because what you couldn't say to the world, here are these people who are criminals and whatever, and the next thing they get elected as a member of parliament, the Westminster parliament. So uh, it is both a defining moment in terms of uh, the struggle, but I also think, and I should never forget this, for our generation, all of us who were involved in that struggle uh, and around the prisoner struggle, it it is a it is a moment of history that defines us. So, if you're asking me over my lifetime, how am I defined as a Republican? Then I say it's the hunger strikes uh, that define me. It's it's our 1916. It's our moment when everything really comes into focus in a way uh, that was really amazing. And of course, out of that then, uh, with Bobby Sands' election, emerges the electoral strategy. Let me just hold you there, because I'm interested in, the situation of course is that, uh, that, that conditions are inflicted upon prisoners, both in the blocks and also in Armagh. And there's an understanding as to why this is happening by the prisoners in both, both prisons. From a practical reality, how do you begin? Any good campaign needs information. So you need to tell the outside world. 
what's going on. Prisoners are isolated, they're either isolated in cells or isolated in blocks. So, Jake, how do you begin that process? How do you begin to inform the world this is what's happening when the British have already begun uh, a counter misinformation strategy? So, what do you do? Well, I think the most, the most important defining moment within the hate blocks, and I think you need to remember that there's a, a leadership outside which is looking at the broad struggle which is trying to counter this strategy in its own way, and then you people inside the prisons. And we were unfortunate from 76 through to 78 in that the prison leadership took a very dogmatic and what they call the principal stand, absolutely no wearing of the uniform, no taking visits, no going to mass. That means no communication. And it actually took an influx of people from the cages uh, to change that. Could you just explain what the cages are? So the cages were the, the place where prisoners with political status were still held. So a number of those people are brought down into the H-blocks after an altercation with prison staff. And they arrive in the H-blocks and one of them is appointed the officer commanding of the IRA prisoners in the jail. And himself and Bobby Sands then become pivotal in changing the approach within the prison. And what they do is they issue a statement to all prisoners in 78, and that's at the height of the brutality. And they say, we know that conditions in the hate blocks are horrendous. We know that we're asking young people to persist with a protest, which is bringing a very heavy cost. But remember, comrades, the future of the struggle rests on our shoulders. So that important? That's what they said. And I remember when that statement was read out, I went, oh no. <laughs> so in reality, you're, you're in that situation, but then what begins from 78 through to 79 is that the, the authorities take out what they perceive as the prison leadership. So they take a whole squad of us and they put us up in H6. And that's all the OCs, the base OCs, all of the key figures from each of the blocks. Their purpose is to isolate the rest of the prisoners. But what they do is they give us almost a year to strategize. So we're in that convey. And we literally put it the leadership outside that we're going for a hunger strike as early as 1979. And the leadership says, no way, not happening. And I, I understood it at the time because if you're if you're leading a very broad struggle and you're playing against that very real canvas of a, of a a life and death struggle on the streets. The last thing you need is a distraction which forces you to put all your eggs in one basket. So I can understand the leadership's opposition, but the arguments being put forward by Bobby and by others, the OC at the time, were simply saying, we can't ask young men and young women to endure these conditions ad infinitum. Mm. There were prisoners who had already lost their mental stability. Prisoners who had, had to leave the blocks. And so the the, the process begins. Um, Cardinal O'Fee, he makes his statement, the famous Sewers of Calcutta statement, where he visits the blocks. But privately, in, in mass, he says to us, look, your leadership on the outside and us and others are going to try to resolve this. And here's what's going to happen. And he explains about the formation of the National Page Block RMA Committee. And Tom can talk more about that because you were it was there. remote, we didn't know. Yeah. But they're talking about this broad-based campaign and what Bobby Sands does is he gets hundreds and hundreds of names and addresses, every left-wing paper on the globe, which comes from you, yourself, Joe, or your, yeah, yeah. your non-diploma today. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Won't tell everybody. No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> but they, so we're sent in reams and reams of names and we simply sit down and write on cigarette papers because we've no... Let me hold you there on that thought because that's key to the mobilisation. And, and I, the reason I'm stopping you mid-flow, which you don't do very often, but Jake, I want to ask Sheila, was the same procedure happening within... Can I ask you a question which you're going to slap me in the face later on with? And Jake mentioned the heavy burden on young people. What age were you during that, that, that period, that 18, 18 period? I was 18 when I went in. 18. And I did five years. And what age was the average? Was the average? The average age know? was between, there was one or two came in at, at 16 years old, the rate of AIDS and from the bone was 16, her brother Sean died in the age blocks with a heart attack. Uh, there was 16, mostly 
age between 18 and 20 would be would be the, the main so age. So just to paint this this uh, this picture, I want Columbus to pick up on it. But just uh, this this almost the weight of a struggle for Irish freedom is on the shoulders of 18, 19, 16 year olds, both in the Armagh and also in the Blacks. You, you, you know that that information is central to mobilisation. So Jake's talked about this list, so nearly the lobby list is, is in the prison. Was that the same experience in Armagh? It was. Um, we spent most of our time um, writing letters, you just gave people names and addresses. And, and it wasn't not a letter in the sense that you know a letter, I mean the smuggled letters written on generally prison issue toilet paper or cigarette papers, um, folded up very small, smuggled out to the, the age block office on the Falls Road and then sent on. Um, and then also you have to understand, we were also getting feedback because we were getting in on cigarette papers, you know, protests took place here, there were hundreds here, there were, so you knew it was having an impact, and I'm not talking about protests just in Belfast City Centre or Dublin, I'm talking about America and Germany and France and H-Block, our lab committee set up all over the world. So when you're getting information like that and you're saying to yourself, well, it's, it's making an impact, and it has to have been making an impact on the British, you want that this, as far as they were concerned, this was a criminal conspiracy, and the IRA were gangsters, and uh, communities were held in fear, and then people were getting the truth, the other side of the story. I'm going to ask Tom just to, to, to give us that broadness off that, but the letters that, that both of us were, were writing out uh, to interested parties, to people who would take an interest, who would do it, were they, did they speak of the conditions yeah. and then ask for help? Maybe you can paraphrase one of the letters. Not just the conditions. It. You would have started it off with, there was kind of a format that everybody would have, and, and the, you explained where you came from in the first place, you know, where the struggle came from in the first place, because it didn't just, people didn't, didn't wake up one day and say, do you know what, I want to go out and join the IRA and go to jail. And so there was a bit of an explanation of here in the north of Ireland, such and such is happening, and here is why, and then explaining the conditions and why you were taking that stand, uh, you know, to, to say to people, you know, to criminalise the prisoners is to criminalise our community, is to criminalise our struggle. This is the history of it and we're not accepting it. So yeah, all of that was that was all explained in the letters. I want to come back, but I also want to let Jake in. So by 1980, the Brits have issued a document called H Blocks of Facts, which is on free release and centred sent all around the world. They have the television media, they have the media in general, given a sympathetic view to what's going on in the prison. Tom, that small group of people who formed an isolated hitch block information office that you were sampled to. Uh, I want you to talk about that. And I, and I also want you to talk about a, a fictional character called Liam Oak, which in fact is you. Okay, so Jay's going to expose me, but I'm certainly going to expose you first. So I was appointed head of the POW department, I think sometime shortly before the first hunger strike. And was there a, already a department that existed? There was already a field of department, but I was appointed uh, the head. And one of my tasks was to uh, really beef up the communications with the uh, prisoners in all the blocks. And one of the first people I went to was Maura McCrory, who was really uh, one of the leaders of the Relatives Action Committee in this city. And uh, we started then to work on that issue. So by the time we were finished, we were able to send a communication in uh, in the morning, get an answer out by dinner hour, put another communication in, and also get a, an answer out in the afternoon. And that was with all the blocks. The other thing that we did, uh, and I think the bits didn't know about it, because it was important for us as uh, Sheila and Jaeger saying is that the prisoners knew what was happening, uh, even the head of us telling uh, And so therefore we uh, were able to get a small number of radios into uh, the blocks. You need to explain that just for the, for the viewer or the listeners. These are not transistor radios. No, no, they're small micro uh, radios. Okay. Uh, so handmade? Were, uh, handmade, yes. Uh, and they were sent in to uh, a number were sent in. And because of the location of the BBC aerial, you know, at Blurs, 
the reception was very, very good. Thank so, God for the beep. <laughs> so they were getting the best of reception and were uh, really, so they were sending us out material on the basis of the news that they had heard. So you had really, and of course, uh, and she'd never be forgotten, the role of families then. I mean, it wasn't just our communications, you know, coming from the office, uh, but also families were going in and informing the prisoners what was taking place. Uh, and were a very vital link uh, in, in this whole process. Um, so it meant, you know, Jake was saying there uh, about, you know, right now, so the churches were like right to trade unions, sporting organisations, women's organisations, international organisations, governments, uh, all of these, uh, there, there must have been literally thousands and thousands of pieces of communication uh, coming out of the blocks at the time, and of course, out of Armagh. Yeah. And what really, I think, heightened the message, oddly enough, was the fact that they came out often in cigarette paper. You know, and um, so all of these uh, messages, some of them went direct, because there was such a volume, and uh, those, uh, some came to us. So everyone that, that came into our office, it was typed up uh, so that it could be read easily. Transcribed? Yes, so that, that it was easy, you, you know, because sometimes, yeah, we get in the way of reading them, you know, but uh, if you're reading it for the first time, you know, the writing was so small. Uh, and so that communication between the outside uh, and the prisoners, I think, was just, uh, it was so vital it, it, because, you know, there are times when the pressure comes on uh, in terms of, you know, somebody's going in to see the prisoners. Uh, uh, and so the communication at these points are really vital. So it was uh, really, really important at the time uh, to maintain that communication. I want to just go back to the point which the three was made separately and, and not necessarily in response to any, any given question. And you talked about part of that three-pronged strategy was criminalisation. So here we have a situation where the Brits have a criminalisation strategy which is obviously paid. The response to it has put the Irish struggle, for better or for worse, on the platform that it never had enjoyed. The British have launched a propaganda campaign both in Europe and America, talking about the wonderful conditions that exist within the prison and in, within Armagh, within the block, within Armagh. And the prisoners are responding to this and they're, and they're fighting back. And we also have added to that Tom's department increasing that communication with his victim. First of all, you would explain two things, and I know the answer to them, but I'd like you to explain why were people writing on toilet roll and on cigarette papers? That's one aspect of it. And was there a stage when the when the prison uh, administration realised that there was this massive fight back happening within the prison? So did they did they read to try and stop it? So first of all, a very simple question: Why were people writing? on cigarette papers and on toilet roll. Well, when you arrived on the, the, the protest, you were stripped of your own clothing. You were put in the cell, which was uh, six foot by seven foot by eight foot concrete box. You had a mattress, three blankets, a water gallon, and a chamber pot. Nothing else. No radio, no TV, no newspapers, no writing paper, no pens, no, nothing. So that was the first. In physical terms, we had to find ways to get around that. So that meant, how do you get something in the right with? Yeah. What do you write with? What do you write on? And I think this is the, the, the critical point in all of that in the communications. I think that we in the prison recognised two eras. There was the pre Lemo era, which we called the, the doldrums. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where we love codes. And anyone who was out about at the time probably know what the doldrums were. Yeah. But we were getting misinformation. Yeah. We felt. So there was a, an imperative from within the prison to get accurate information. We don't need Molly Cuddled. Do you know what I mean? They're, they were, we're all frontline soldiers in a struggle. All be, it, all be 18 and 19. All be 18 and 19, but that's, that's what wars are for. Right? Yeah. So we're all there. We don't need Molly Cuddled. Tell us the truth. You know, we, we work together. So post-AMO, 
two things, three things revolutionise it. Can I make confessions? But I need guidance on one of them. Is possessing a crystal radio set still an indictable offence? Well, if it is, Tom's going to jail. So I think, <laughs> I think we should all say that Tom's well. Oh, okay. Well, I had a crystal radio set. Where um, had you got a crystal radio set? Um, the only place we were able to carry anything uh, within the prisons was secreted inside our bodies. Okay. So in your back passage, wrapped in stretch and sea. And that's the only way to get stuff in and out of the prison. Okay. Because remember, you, have, you go on a visit and you have a screw stand beside you and you have your relatives up or whoever. The only thing that Liam Oak was brilliant at doing, and others helped him, was to organise what we call the army visits. So we got one visit a month, but every prisoner had to give up a visit. A family visit? They had to give up a family or a visit. Personal visit or a personal, personal visit. Or a personal visit to take an army visit. And there were an army of mostly women, uh, overwhelmingly women, who come up in those visits. Jim Gimney came down again, but it was mostly women. Yeah. And um, those women were the vital communication network between inside and outside. And it, it can't be praised high enough. And uh, they carried in radios, cameras, pens, paper, flints, refills out of Parker pens, all of the all of the wherewithal to write all these poems. And we couldn't have done it without that. So they come in, we drew up templates for, for letters. So for example, uh, five or six of us, it was myself, Bobby Sands, Richard Raw, Big McFarland, Shanna Brownlock, different people. And what they did was they drew up a template. So this is the type of letter you need to write to a left-wing organization internationally. This is the type of letter you need to go to a GAA club. Just what Tom was saying, you categorized it. And people just churned them out in their hundreds. Now, you were saying that we mostly wrote on toilet paper and cigarette paper. Well, I have to confess that during that period, and this is a second confession, yeah. I wrote my way from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Judges. I was using the edge of the Bible. Okay, so well, let me tell you, that's why you're going to hell. But, <laughs> but I could. Now, the third confession, and the third confession was a new setting. You're sitting on a cell and you know how much work it went into producing the radio sets how long it was to get them in, all the effort that people went to. And you had a wee loop of wire which round the pipe once and tightened it, that was BBC. But I found out if you looped it twice and tightened it, you could get different radio stations through. And so I would put the earphone in the quiet of the night and listen to John Peel, which was against the rules. You weren't allowed to do that. You weren't allowed to do that. You also, people got this thing at the uniform, it was principal stand, you weren't allowed to wear it. They used to leave it in the cell, see what was free, I put the boots and the coat on. <laughs> in, in, this, in the secrecy. It wasn't technically worn. It wasn't technically But the thing about all this is, I think that as Republicans, and this was certainly true in the GB doldrum period, we hung ourselves up on principles, which weren't principles. We hamstrung ourselves. And it was in the Liam Oak era onwards, and that's when we get into, let's discuss electoralism. Uh, let's look how you move this struggle forward. And that freeing up of the last remnants of an old conservative, narrow leadership were overthrown in that period. I want to ask, I want to ask uh, Sheila, just nearly an extension of that. Um, there is a, there is a nearly a, an industrial Operation get on within the blocks uh, to respond to British propaganda and explain the conditions of the prisoners, to expose the beatings and all the stuff that's going on. It's been fed out saying it's all of that has happened. The women in our mat are a smaller group of people. Is there a hunt going on within the prison to try and disrupt your ability to alert the world to what was going on? And what form did it take? Was it prison raids, the cell raids, moves, whatever? It was within our mind, it could, it could be very oppressive. Um, at the most during the protest, I think the highest number were 40 of us, but some of them women were certain shorter sentences. So the bulk ended up with about 32 of us. Um, and in February 1980, they did what they called a, a, a wing search and locked us all down and forced us. You see, Armagh wasn't on, when the men were already on the no wash protest, Armagh wasn't because we were still allowed to wear our own clothes, so we were still getting an hour's exercise and could use the toilets. But when this happened in February 1980, we were forced into a position of going on to the wash protest as well. 
and it was a control. I think they thought because it was a smaller number that we would be easier and to control. And because women, I presume. We would be easier to break. Yeah, and so and I have to say, I mean, when we talk about the you know, wash protest, and it's, it's common knowledge to us, to, to people who were there and around at the time, it wouldn't be common knowledge maybe to a lot of other people, because you have to understand, when women in are, are in a situation like that, you have the added problem of menstruation. Yeah. So we weren't, you know, um, you weren't getting out to the toilet. Uh, you were, you, you were doing everything in the cell. So when you were plastering the walls with with a screen, women who were menstruating, it, obviously, I mean, Nell Cafferty wrote an article for the Irish Times, and I think it shocked the life clean out of a lot of people because part of there was a there was a women's movement. There was a growing women's movement on the outside. You know this this uh, growing movement for women's liberation. But they wouldn't recognise us, and they wouldn't say anything in support of us, because it was nearly as if we were tabooed. Like it was great to fight for women's liberation, but it wasn't great to be a member of the Liberation Army. Mm. And then Neil McLafferty wrote her article for the Irish Times, and I think it was like a slap in the face. That isn't an unusual situation. I want to let Tom in here, but he's been very patient. But if you trace back the Irish uh, suffragette movement, you'll find that the British suffragette movement, because Irish suffragettes tended to be more militant, and a section often talked about Ireland's freedom as well as women's freedom, rightly so. You found that there was that nearly political snobbery that, that existed then. So it doesn't, it isn't a surprise that, that, that a section of the women's liberation, not more. Had, had a difficulty in supporting clearly the struggle there. And Tom, <clears throat> we are, we, you, we just explained there to improve the communication, to disseminate in, to make sure that there's a smooth passage of information back and forth. And Jake talked, and Sheila both talked about, you know, targeting where it went, GA clubs or church groups or wherever it may have been. And criminalization is the, is the strategy the Brits are operating. So was your job to send information that you received out of the jail, your department's job, was it to confine it to Ireland? Were you expand it? Were you using it internationally? Was it been used abroad? And if it was, to whom? But just before I answer yeah. that, Joe, one of the other uh, things we were able to do is we miniaturized the unpublished. Now, just explain that. What so, that you mean? know, the public paper. Yes. So, we miniaturized it, so we made it about that small and then sent that in. Uh, it seems to me, when I look back on it, that you had the operation in, uh, of communications into Sebastopol Street, but Sebastopol Street couldn't at the time have dealt with the enormous amount of uh, communication coming out of the blocks and out of Warmah. So what happened, and I think this is probably the majority of material coming out of the blocks, it went to families. So it, it, it went direct to hundreds of organisations, but it went through families, through local areas, you know, through local people who were involved in the uh, Hitch Block Committee. Yeah. Uh, so in, in essence, it was a mobilisation, a communication mobilisation that was bigger than... Uh, our office in Sebastopol Street, and that that in itself is a power of communication. Because when uh, the comms came out of the blocks, families were then transcribing them, uh, and then sending a call with a letter on to someone in New York or another family member, yes, or a, or friend. a friend or a club, uh, and so there was this mass, you know, participation in just ensuring these communications, and of course. Uh, one of the effects of that was that that really countered the efforts of the British Foreign Office to uh, to paint this, uh, the prisoner struggle up as a criminal conspiracy, and, and the, the hunger strike just blasted its way uh, through that. So uh, communication, and it's also a sense of empowerment. It wasn't just that the prisoners were sitting at the receiving end of all of this, uh, and then uh, you know putting all their effort into just the hunger strikers. So the prisoners had a very broad role themselves uh, as prisoners. They were participating. And then, of course, that participation uh, resulted in thousands of people on a march. OK, uh, you know, the, the opening up of the issue. I mean, 
one of the things accomplished by the hunger strikes, and of course uh, the, uh, the election of prisoners, was that it, an internationalized, uh, internationalized what was taking place mm -hmm. in the hate blocks uh, in Armagh. So uh, it, it was really a very concentrated uh, period of all our lives, you know, concentrated. It, you know, in a sense, I, I, I have never come through a period like it since. And now I've come through a lot, but now the hunger strikes were very special. And that's why I say, you know, uh, the, the hunger strikes and the hate blocks and our ma defined our generation. If there's one event that says, what are you about? I think it's a hunger strike. I want to move us on because time is being minded. Um, one of the things and one of the lanes that you're, you're all very aware of that the Brits uh, adapted when it was clear that they were beginning to lose that, that war of uh, criminality, criminalisation. Tom speaks of, and you all speak of, the election of prisoners and mass support in the streets and all that. And you can see, if you trace it back, you can see that the Brits then, either through design or through just circumstances, began to change and they presented the prisoners as being the victims of a leadership that was callous. So you had this thing, you know, that prisoners don't really know what's happened. They've been, they've been ordered to do all of that. I, I, I want to just talk briefly again with the three of us, but I want to ask you, Jake, first of all, you know, we've got the communication in and out. You, you have a radio secreted somewhere. I'm not going to ask you where, but I can imagine. Uh, you listen to the news, uh, and, and is it then your job to translate that, not too much to translate, but to pass on that news to other prisoners? And, and is that the reason that this, this army of people sent in to soft soap the prisoners keeps failing? Yeah. The prisoners are well informed. So if you don't mind me taking you through, you taking me through the ABCs. So you listen to the news, what do you do after that? Well, there are three three layers of, of information to see on the blocks. There's the radios, there are visits, and there are written communications. And the way they were all dealt with was that they would be distilled by the wing-to-wing -wing leaderships. So we've all these hate blocks, three occupied wings and each of the three hate blocks. So nine OCs make a decision, here's the most important part of the news, and that is given out to door in Irish. So we relay the news to all the other prisoners. We can't see each other. Yeah, that's so point, yeah. that there becomes a central point for the collection of information that comes up the pipes. And you get some some strange ones. Just, like, just let me stop you. I know apologies. Oh, right, sorry, yeah. No, no, I want you to follow this through. When you say things like it comes up the pipes, yeah. like, what does that mean? Well, the, what happened was there were small holes in the central heating pipes at the back of the cells, and you could whisper news from cell to cell, okay, right. or physically pass communications from cell to cell. And they come to a the point where they were out. Now, there were a couple of men were brilliant. Um, I'll name one of them, Hector McNeil. Yes. Hector used to get a half hour visit like the rest of us, but he put back away on an hour and a half's news, which was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so you always had the fact of that. And yeah. there, were, there were people coming in with more news than they could possibly have gotten in half an hour. So, yeah, there was a sifting operation. And we, we tried as hard as we could within the H blocks to ensure there was no hierarchy. You needed a command structure, but there was no hierarchy. People, people were all active participants. And I think the one thing you need to, to, to really stand back and awe of in that period is we're pitted against, and I mean us inside and the movement outside, are pitted against one of the most well-resourced governments Absolutely. in the world. And it's pumping out massive propaganda. And here's these uppity takes countering that with nothing more than, than refills mm -hmm. and cigarette papers. And so the sense of arrogance within the Brits doesn't allow them to, to process that. They need to put it down. And that's that's the policy they keep on. How do they react physically to it? Within the hate blocks, they introduce what's called the mirror search. So the mirror search is a piece of sponge which has a mirror inserted on it. And every time you leave the cell or every time you get a cell search, you're battered down over it. So they hold your arms. Hold your hair and a screw kicks your legs. And you're and naked. And you're naked. And they, they pull apart your anus to, to carry out a search. And then some of them would insert a finger in the anus. Uh, it was even worse in Armagh, where the, the indignity of strip search of menstruating women horrified, as Sheila said, horrified people outside. People didn't know this was happening. 
the same screw who would search or Amos would then search around their mouth for, for communiques and up your nose. And we're doing this in visitors as well. Visitors being, were being subjected to strip searching, coming in and out of the prisons. Families, sisters, mothers. So all of this stuff is hitting so many layers within society. People are going, this is horrendous what's happening. But stand back from all that. It's absolutely unbelievable. We have to live with it 24 hours a day. People might say we're living here 24 hours a day. I know that at times, people within the centre of that broad movement outside were getting banned two and three hours sleep a night. Sometimes we weren't getting sleep. Yeah. I mean, we knew inside the prison, okay, we read our comms and that's it. But if I sent a comm out, somebody has to transcribe it. Somebody has to put a book in the it. Somebody has to put it in a novel. It has to go somewhere. Otherwise, there's no point reading it. So this mobilisation, as Tom talked about, is a massively broad-based community mobilisation, and it touches all sorts of, of levels. And the prison regime reacts to all of those things. Uh, I mean, they, they, they were astounded that we could smuggle so much stuff in. I remember right at the start, my poor mother, who she wasn't have been the, the most worldly woman, the great woman, um, very clear in her politics, but my mother, I sent out and said, um, you need to smuggle tobacco in. I said, you need to get cigarette papers, get tobacco, squeeze it quite tight, wrap it up in stretch and seal it, bring it in almost like a tampon. So she did that and we got it in that night. Like, war horse tobacco, pipe tobacco. I went, oh, Jesus Christ. So what we did was we but brought- But then you smoke it. We brought, all the, we, we brought all the tobacco together and we, we mixed. mixed the war horse down with the other stuff. And never forget, we, we just lit up the cigarettes and how you lit up cigarettes was you rolled the paper, you tore strips off your towel and made it work. And you hung that work and lit it and swung it from cell to cell so that everybody could light their cigarette. And you dispatched the cigarettes by a button and a string from one side of the wing to the other. So everyone just took a, a cigarette. Just to fling it across the floor. Fling it across the bitumen on the floor. So we were all lighting up <laughs> those screws at the top of the wing shirts. Mr. Barnes! And the screw says, Mr. Arnold, what is it? He says, one of these three have smuggled the pipe in. <laughs> it was, I don't believe you. <laughs> so <laughs> there were wee moments like that that sort of gave me a wee lift. I, I, want to, I want to just go to Sheila Diana and to Tom, and I'm very mindful that we're trying to get so much squeezed in such a little, a relatively small space. But I can I just respond to something that you said to the, that remind me, this David and Goliath battle that's going on, unlimited resources in, the ha in behalf of the British government. I remember one of the most obscene things, uh, a news piece where uh, a local journalist who should be ashamed of himself going to the, the so-called canteen and, and getting the, the food, and we know that food was used as a punishment, but getting this food and sitting down and going, yum, 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 you couldn't complain about this, as if this was what was happening. But, but more sinister, and again, this battle that you're talking about that's going on waging, and you can see some of the results of it still to this day. The effect of those letters that you speak of, and the effect of that co that community response is America's beginning to understand what's happening. So the British government launched this hits block of facts. Every university in America, every library in America is given this propaganda document free. They're also given a list of people who they can bring into embassies and who do interviews on their local radio stations. So that was the, that was the head of it. That was the head of it. It's just another thing, Joe, I think, you, you, and they need to put this in because people who didn't live through it don't know it. Look at any image of the time and you'll see women on the street with children wearing hardly helmets, plastic helmets in their heads. So what the British government do and what the British establishment do is not only attack the prisoners and attack the propaganda, they also deliberately decide to murder women and children with plastic bullets. Mm -hmm. And it's no mistake that it's women and children who are killed. And they also decide not just to kill them with plastic bullets, but to use wholly owned subsidiaries within the loyalist terror gangs to kill the East Black Army mm -hmm. to form their they, they to shoot them. Yeah. You know, okay. So this is not as if the British are putting out nice brochures. They're also shooting people dead in their houses and shooting children dead in the street. You know, so I think I wasn't outside and I don't know how, how terrifying that period was, but from the inside, we certainly knew that our mothers, our sisters, were in mortal danger protesting on our behalf. I want to bring Sheila in, who's been unusually quiet. And we talked earlier on the beginning of this of prisoners been seen as the weak link in the struggle for freedom. 
wrong, but they were that's how the British government I would say the Labour government initially, and of course then adopted by Tories. I think sometimes we forget that it was Labour who engineered the, 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 the confrontation in the prisons to their shame. But if, if prisoners were seen as the weakest links, weakest link, were, were women prisoners seen? Do you think as being particularly vulnerable? And if they were, were they? Were they targeted? I mean, I know there were delegations that went into the blocks to try and break the prisoners. Did you have the same response, the same fact? Yeah, well, I think initially um, they probably thought women were the weaker link. But I think they learned in a very short time that we weren't. Um, that there's no way we were going to sit back and take it. And yes, we had the, the Board of Visitors coming in. We had, I don't know, various different people coming in and trying to put pressure on, you know, um, even had things like the Legion of Mary coming in and trying to, you know, because we were supposed to be good Catholic girls, so yeah. the Legion of Mary was coming but in. But you were, of course. Of course we were. And coming in, putting pressure on us to end the protest, and the people were just looking at them going, I already don't take your wee prayer book, but, you know, that's about it. Because you used the wee prayer book to wrap up cigarettes and smoke, you know. I always tell people I never read the Bible in jail, but I smoked it. Because um, the that even the toilet paper jigs talking about the toilet paper, this is how petty and how mean they could be with things. You would have got nine sheets of toilet paper a day. Now, I'm not talking about Cushel or Andrex. I'm talking about this stuff that we could write letters on. It was like writing paper. Mm -hmm. It was like tracing paper. You could see it through it. Bring tears well, to your eyes. Is exactly. that what you're saying? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. But that's, I mean, that's how petty they were. Uh, even in terms of like, Say if a woman had her period, they would have delivered, say, two sanitary towels a day and then come back and give her another two the next day and then give her. They, they wouldn't allow you to have a packet of sanitary towels in the day. And, they, and some of the stuff they did just floored me. It floored me. It was totally petty. And then you had some screws that were just, you know, that just stood outside a cell and smoked a cigarette. None of the smell of the smoke of the cigarette was going into the cells, you know. Yeah, yeah, the break of it. Uh, trying to smuggle in wee bits of tobacco, rolling it up in, in the sheets of the Bible and smoking it. And, and this, this petty woman is standing inside the cell. You also had in our man, there were a lot of, they called them trade screws, but it was male screws. And initially in, in the February attack, that's what was on the wings in our man. They beat women up, they carried women. They actually physically went in with, you know, you see it in the films with the riot sheets. Yeah. Pin women down, grabbed them, four of them grabbed a woman to carry her to an adjudication. And there was a case where a woman was literally stripped, you know, her, her top was right up around her. And this is the type of stuff that they did. And every time they did something like that, I think it was this idea of, ah, she gave up. And the more they did things like that, the more we kind of just bonded together and, and said no. I want to, I want to just kind of, Try and summarize the discussion, which is fascinating and it, and it deserves more time. And I apologize we don't have more time, but this communication, Tom, that you, your department is responsible for, which is mobilization, which is all of that, and it's going worldwide. Were there, were there, any, were there any surprises? Were there, you know, were there people, for instance, in France or people in Germany who were not necessarily fellow travelers of republicanism, but who from a humanitarian or from a legal point of view, just kind of rode in behind the prisoners? And if there were, do they remain friends? One of the connections I think made during the hunger strike, you know, with, we, made, uh, we made connections all over the world. And they, there were marches, for instance, in Paris. You know, a concerts, say concerts in Berlin, there'd be a H-block, uh, peasants where they'd be collecting money for the mm -hmm. prisoners. Yeah. But I want to come back on a point, Joe, that I think sometimes we fail to see. That this mass mobilization of both prisoners and people outside in itself is a political exercise in understanding the roots and need for a broad-based struggle. So if you're a prisoner writing to a trade unionist, without probably thinking about you're beginning to see the value of reaching out to others that normally you may not have reached out to. So the, the in, in essence, uh, the very heart of the driving uh, the Hitchcock struggle was this need to broaden the participation 
of those involved in the struggle for national independence in Ireland. Uh, and the prisoners uh, were able to achieve that, not just by their actions uh, in protest, not just by their actions in the hunger strike, but also by their actions in their mass participation in, in, in sending notes out. And because all the time, because the single message was, the more people we speak to, the more people who know what is happening in the blocks, the stronger our case becomes. And I'm thinking, you know, we need to put a human face in that. Uh, and the, the prisoners were always sustained by what was happening outside. So when there was a big march on the road here, the prisoners got details of, not from just us, from their families. That sustained them. But also stuff like, do you remember in Sebastian Street, Mrs Murphy? One of her roles was to say the rosary every night during the hunger strikes. Say the rosary at the corner of Sebastian Street and the Falls Road. Uh, and you would get a small crowd there. But that was happening all over Belfast. Uh, and we think of marches and, you know, even writing. But here you have a, a, maybe a group of uh, women of a street uh, being very conscious of, of the hitch blocks in Armagh and in their way, saying the rosary every night. And, uh, I mean, in all of this, the struggle in the prisons was nothing without the struggle of the people outside. Because that, that's that linkage. And I think it is one time when, you know, we as Republicans often argue about making people spectators to struggle. Well, in fact, uh, what the hitch blocks in Armagh did was to make people uh, activists in this deep uh, struggle for not national independence, but also for the rights of prisoners and the political rights of us all. We're out of time, but we're not out of time to the last questions you would expect of me to keep the, the hard questions we'll ask. And I mentioned when I began that each of you are successful authors in your own right. I don't know that's a coincidence, and I didn't realise that would be the case until we, we started this interview. And I look around and I just realised that. Tom said that the hunger strike and the prison struggle even from an outside perspective, was a life-changing situation. And the question that I asked was, was it a moment, in, was it a defining moment in history? And I'm going to end with that, but before I do, was it a defining moment for Jake, for Sheila and for Tom? Yeah, um, for me it was anyway. I mean, you, you can't come through that intensity of a struggle without, without it impacting on your life. I mean, and to bring it down, I think Tom's always in you, bring it down to the human. We were in a, a wing with 40 people. Three people out of those 40 died in hunger strike. So that, that's how it's almost one person in 10 out of your wing. I knew all the hunger strikers personally. Um, knew some of them very, very well. So yes, it, it, it's a huge impact, but the bigger impact and the one that you need to carry with you is the political lessons of it. And for me, Tom, Tom touches on it, that broad mobilisation, we're in a critical moment in Irish history again. The um, misadventures of the Tories and unionism have brought us to a point where the future shape of this island is on the table. So we need to take lessons from the hate spots. How do we get the message across that there's a better Ireland? that there is a more visionary place to get to. And the way to do that is you mobilise within the trade unions, within the GAA, which is all happening already, but it needs to be intensified. And, and done better. Need, <clears throat> and done better. And done better. So that someone within a, a, a GAA club in New York, or in Ulaanbaatar, because there are GAA clubs all over the world now, that they begin articulating the need for a democratic resolution of Ireland's British problem. Let, let me just stop you. Know, about this that. is a very poor job I've got, because I've been listening to this all till the night of the Christ comes home. So Sheila, can I ask you the same question? At not only a defining moment in Irish history, but was it a defining moment for Sheila Dar? I would say very much so. Um, I think it's a period, once you've been through it, that you, you, you never forget. I mean, these are the big, like this is the big anniversary, 40 years, but Every year, you don't come to that anniversary uh, without knowing, you know, that's the date that Bobby died, that's the date that Frank died, and you remember where you were. It's like the, 
Where were you when JFK was shot? Yeah. You're old yeah. enough to remember that. Or um, John Lennon. Or, or John Lennon. But uh, it, it, yes, and it, it also, I think it, it opened our eyes, well, it opened my eyes to a more strategic way of thinking. Because what it taught us with the prisons and outside was if one strategy and one tactic isn't working for you and you see something else another way, follow that way. And I think that's a lot of what we learned. We learned that through, uh, first of all, the, the election of Bobby Sands, you know, where people have been saying, yes, you use it no support. And then suddenly there it was there. And then Bobby died and they brought in the, the, the rule that another prisoner couldn't stand, so on Karen Street. And even more people come out and voted for all. So that was kind of a wee bit of an awakening for us. That we, we that people will put their, their X on the bit of paper. They're not afraid to come out and say, yes, we support these people. I'm going to ask, you, you, you kind of answered it, Tom, in a, a roundabout way, but I want to ask you directly. So a defining moment for Tom Hartley? Very much so. But, you know, there were very, very dark moments during that push. You know, we talk about the strengths of our struggle, but there were very, very dark moments particularly when we lost the Hamburg, very dark. And I remember, you know, Steve McQueen. Uh, the director? Yes, uh, even shown his film. And he, uh, he had talked to a number of us beforehand to get our sense of the events. And then uh, he gave a private showing for a number of us. And it struck me at the time, this is years after the hunger strike, and the emotions that welled up in you when you saw that film. Uh, and it just reminded you that you, you know, uh, as an activist, you know, you came through that period. Uh, like uh, all of us, I think we, we, there was a task and we just set about trying to achieve. Uh, but it was highly emotional. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some senses, uh, you buried your emotions during that uh, period. But so many years later, when they're triggered by a film, that you begin to understand those dark moments uh, in that hunger strike. Now, you felt them at the time, but I think uh, you, you tried to manage them, and you did manage them better. Uh, and so the hunger strikes, you know, uh, they it was uh, a really... Uh, big time, I think, a really uh, important time in the um, in the life of the Republican struggle. Because as Sheila said, tactically, uh, you come out a bit more fluid. You know, politically, you had a better sense of the characteristics of a good struggle. Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, the lessons learned were just, you know, they were just disgusting, you know, you, it was, in a sense, a, a new politic that started to emerge uh, through the hunger strikes uh, and in the aftermath of the hunger strikes. Uh, and in some senses, you could see, I mean, you could see the Anglo-Irish agreement is an effort uh, by the British and Irish governments. One element of it is an effort to undermine Republicans. Specifically, it was about that. Uh, and then, of course, what you get is the loyalist campaign of the late 1980s to undermine uh, and uh, try and separate us from our base. And all of that stuff now has happened before, but I think in a way, all of that stuff happened, uh, you know, as a result of the strengths of uh, a Republican struggle that followed the, uh, the hunger strikes. On that final note, can I, can I thank you for sharing those personal and private and dark and happy and, and funny and incisive experiences that you've all lived? Uh, there's, a, there's a line in the song, we may have brave men, we may have had brave men and women. I'm not so sure we'll ever have better. So Tom, Sheila, Jake, got a minute of it. Thank you.